Hello there, John here. I hope you're really, really well. Uh, it's lovely to see you. Welcome to this week's book club. Uh, this is video number 10, I think. Um, we have one more week to go after this and then we have a, a five or six week break. So we're back at the, the end of January. So um, yeah, I wanted to kind of, originally this was going to be the last week. And so I was going for a kind of a big end. Um, and then we've decided to kind of program one more because we can get it in there, you know, and uh, we don't want to leave to kind of too big a gap. So um, let's get straight in. And today uh, we looked at uh, a short story that was originally written in, in 1955, but wasn't published in English until the early 70s. Um, and it's uh, a story called A Very Old Man with Enormous Wings by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And of course, um, Marquez is a, a huge literary figure. Um, sadly, he died a couple of years ago. And um, his work is, is quite rightly beloved around the world. Um, but in this story, which is one of his earliest stories, I'm not sure if he was still working as a journalist at the time when he wrote this, um, we meet um, two characters. Well, we meet two characters and their new child. We meet Peleo and Elisenda, and they've just had a newborn baby. And there's some kind of sort of freak weather conditions going on and it's the time of year wherever they live that there's been a kind of real bloom they live by the sea and there's been a real bloom in um crabs being born and so there are crabs kind of crawling all over the land coming into the house and they're having to kind of kill them and sort of take the bodies down to the sea and everything is just covered with kind of sort of this kind of horrible decay um and in all that uh, Peleo is, is kind of out trying to kind of clear these these crabs away and he sees this strange shape in his garden well what was the garden in the mud uh, and it's so grey and weird that he can't quite tell what it is but he kind of goes over and he sees that there's a very very old man there uh, you know completely bald almost toothless and he would just look like a kind of strange Norwegian sailor or something um, because of his kind of skin tone, uh, if it were not for the fact that he has these massive wings on his back and they're ragged and infested with fleas and, and, and kind of disgusting as well. And um, they, they, they just kind of don't know what to do with him. They stand, they stand for ages looking and looking at him uh, and decide... Uh, that they they just don't know what to do with him, so they they put him in the chicken coop, and they go and ask the woman from next door, who apparently knows everything about life and death. You know, she's one of those people, and um, and she confirms that he's an angel, uh, and people start coming and coming and coming to see the angel. It's quite there's an incredible passage about kind of all these different people kind of coming for healing. I think I'll, I'll read you that a little bit in a minute, and. Um, The woman next door, her uh, solution to their problem after recognising his angel is it's best just kind of club him to death and, and be rid of him. But then people start coming and coming and Alessandra spots the chance to make some money. She starts charging five cents to each person and letting rooms out and things like that. And suddenly within a week they've made a fortune, more money than they've made in, in years and years and years. And she starts buying dresses and um, they start thinking about getting a new house and things like that. I won't tell you any more because it kind of goes from there. Let me read you this little bit and then we'll discuss it a bit more. The curious came from far away. A travelling carnival arrived with a flying acrobat who buzzed over the crowd several times. But no one paid any attention to him because the wings were not those of an angel but rather those of a sidereal bat. The most unfortunate invalids on earth came in search of health. A poor woman who since childhood had been counting her heartbeats and had ran out of numbers. A Portuguese man who couldn't sleep because the noise of the stars disturbed him. A sleepwalker who got up at night to undo the things he'd done while awake. 
and many others with less serious ailments. In the midst of that shipwreck disorder that made the earth tremble, Peleo and Alessander were happy with fatigue, for in less than a week they had crammed their rooms with money, and the line of pilgrims waiting their turn to enter still reached beyond the horizon. The angel was the only one who took no part in his own act. He spent his time trying to get comfortable in his borrowed nest, befuddled by the hellish heat of the oil lamps and sacramental candles that had been placed along the wire. At first, they tried to make him eat some mothballs, which, according to the wisdom of the wise neighbour woman, were the food prescribed for angels. But he turned them down, just as he turned down the paper lunches that the penitents brought him. And they never found out whether it was because he was an angel or because he was an old man that in the end ate nothing but eggplant mush. His only supernatural virtue seemed to be patience, especially during the first days, when the hens pecked at him, searching for the stellar parasites that proliferated in his wings, and the cripples pulled out feathers to touch their defective parts with, and even the most merciful threw stones at him, trying to get him to rise so they could see him standing. The only time they succeeded in arousing him was when they burned his side with an iron for branding steers, for he had been motionless for so many hours that they thought that he was dead. He awoke with a start, ranting in his hermetic language and with tears in his eyes, and he flapped his wings a couple of times, which brought on a whirlwind of chicken dung and lunar dust and a gale of panic that did not seem to be of this world. Although many thought that his reaction had not been one of rage, but of pain, from then on they were careful not to annoy him, because the majority understood that his passivity was not that of a hero taking his ease, but that of a cataclysm in repose. There are several other characters that kind of crop up. Uh, most interesting, I think, is, is the reaction of the, the local priest, um, who, uh, of course, tries speaking Latin to uh, the angel. And when the angel speaks back in, not Latin, but kind of heavenly language, uh, the priest declares that this is no angel whatsoever because he, he doesn't recognise the ministers of God and obviously doesn't speak God's language. What we loved about this story was Marquez's ability to, to take a, a what-if and then set it in a completely real setting and to, to run the story as if it was real. And, you know, it's quite a rare thing that this happens, um, that all the detail just has such depth and ordinariness to it. You can kind of see the, the kind of the time that it's set in, the, the societal ideas of the people, the influence of politics and religion on people at that time. Um, and then to treat this what if, you know, what if a, a, an angel landed in somebody's garden, how would people behave? And uh, in order to kind of get the point across, because at first people were just kind of quite stunned with this story, uh, and, and our group arrives in Bradford, uh, our group meets in Bradford, um, I said, well, what if this was into your garden? How would your neighbours behave? You know, uh, what about kind of, you know, the person who lives two doors away, who knows everything? How how would it be if this was your street and your neighborhood? And that was it. You know, that was it. Uh, we were off. And. Um, yeah, and there's been recent stories, you know, I mean, I don't know if you've watched the the, uh, you know, the 2003 to 2009 remake of Battlestar Galactica that used the same sort of premise. Uh, which is quite incredible. We're talking about, you know, kind of a, a sci-fi show here, but they basically took a kind of the core idea and then ran with it as if it was completely real and followed it through in every ramification of, of it being real. Um, and that just added such depth and grit and reality to it. And Marquez is the, is the master of this. This is, this is his kind of core technique, I think. Um, people call it magic realism, but 
it's just really playing it for real, you know? And yes, there are these kind of fantastical elements, but I, I just can't kind of praise this story highly enough. I just want to hand it to you now and just say, enjoy, you know? Or if you don't enjoy, well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, uh, I'd love to know why kind of thing. Anyway, um, yeah. Yeah, just fantastic. What's also interesting uh, that we found ourselves talking about, which leads us very nicely to our poet that I'll introduce you to in a moment, um, is we were talking about two things. We were talking about how, uh, just generally, how sometimes you read a story and it just stays with you, you know, and this story, I read this many years ago, and it's just stayed with me ever since. Um, and then one of our group was saying that after the Raymond Carver uh, from last week, she kept thinking about the fat man. She kept thinking about the fat man in the diner and, and, and just kind of caring for him. Uh, I'm just looking for these poems, which seem to have disappeared. I'll find them in a second. Um, yeah. And then the other thing we were talking about was um, because somebody kind of Googled uh, Carver and then saw kind of what he'd been like in his kind of life before he kind of got very famous with his first wife and how she supported him and helped him and things like that is that you can find yourself kind of um, not liking the person very much um, and yet liking the art and then feeling a bit kind of guilty for liking the art and this is a kind of a, a common trend uh, in the arts in that kind of you know people are not sort of ideal creations at all and yet out of them can come the greatest works the greatest offerings of kind of you know love and humanity and yet the person themselves may not be you know all that we might imagine them to be but then who of us is, who who of us are or who of us is you know um we've all done things we've all hurt other people uh it depends whether we actually learn from it <laughs> And then kind of try to make amends if possible. Um, I quite like the I quite like the idea of uh, making amends if possible. But of course, as they say in uh, twelve step sort of programs, um, you can't make amends if it's going to make things worse. But that doesn't get you off. You know, that's not a way of kind of just copping out because you feel a bit guilty or something like that. Let me find this poem. Uh, where are they gone? Here we are. Sorry, I was messing my papers up. Um, okay. Uh, so, yeah, so that's actually a very good introduction. The idea that we can be quite a flawed being um, uh, and yet produce incredible art because uh, I decided to introduce them to Charles Bukowski. And um, we looked at two poems by Bukowski. We looked at The World's Greatest Loser and we looked at one of his most famous poems that actually came out after he died, sort of came out posthumously, um, The Laughing Heart. And, well, let me share a little bit of The World's Greatest Loser with you. He used to sell papers in front. Get your winners, get rich on a dime. And about the third or fourth race, you'd see him rolling on his rotten board with roller skates underneath. He'd propel himself along on his hands. He just had small stumps for legs, and the rims of the skate wheels were worn off. You could see inside the wheels, and they would wobble something awful, shooting and flashing imperialistic sparks. He moved faster than anybody, Rolled cigarette dangling. You could hear him coming. God almighty, what was that? The new ones asked. He was the world's greatest loser, but he never gave up. Wheeling towards the two dollar window, screaming, It's the four horse, you fools! How the hell are you going to beat the four? Up on the board, the four would be reading sixty to one. I never heard him pick a winner. They say he slept in the bushes. I guess that's where he died. He's not around anymore. It was the big fat blonde whore who kept touching him for luck and laughing. Nobody had any luck. The whore is gone too. 
I guess nothing ever works for us. We're fools, of course. Booking the inside, plus a 15% take. But how are you going to tell a dreamer that there's a 15% take on the dream? He'll just laugh and say, is that all? I miss those sparks. Well, there you go. That's the whole thing. So, um, we loved the the loving gaze that Bukowski casts upon this person that others would just walk by, would curse in the street. And I'm sure, again, same as with the Marquez, that if this was your town, your street, how would you react to this person? How would your neighbours react? How do the people that you know around you or the, the kind of other people in the town sort of behave towards a person like this? And Bukowski is kind of famous for kind of being the patron saint of kind of the lost and the broken, finding beauty where you're not supposed to find it. Um, and I have to admit that as a writer, I took so many clues from this. Uh, not that I copied him in his writing style at all, but that um, I was always interested in finding beauty where it's not supposed to be. And um, yeah, I mean, this poem, I mean, that image of the uh, the sparks the sparks coming out from the, these kind of almost like broken wheels of these kind of roller skates underneath this rotten board and the, the dangling cigarette. And yet he, he hit the artist's gaze, Bukowski's gaze, gives a, a grace to this person who, you know, you know what this person even smells like from this poem. When I selected Marquez and Bukowski, I didn't initially kind of put them together, you know, um, I just had a kind of uh, a feeling uh, to choose these. And um, and yet I found, or we found that there was such, such similarity in it, in a way. Uh, whereas Bukowski, of course, doesn't have any, any kind of magical elements. He actually just kind of shows you what's there. And Marquez is doing the same thing. He's just kind of showing you what's there. And you meet the people for who they are. Um, Bukowski perhaps even lifts people up a little bit. Uh, and will kind of openly sort of, you know, in many of his poems, um, admit his own kind of uh, flaws. Um, he was a kind of diamond in the rough. And, you know, a very rough diamond at that. So... Um, but I, I love I, I love Bukowski's work and uh, I find myself kind of coming back to him time and time again uh, when supposedly even kind of, you know, better literatures kind of get fatiguing. I don't find Bukowski tiring to read. I find him exhilarating in that he believes in humanity and he keeps finding a way and keeps finding a way even though he's getting in his own way a lot of the time so uh, i'll leave you with that and um please if uh, you've enjoyed uh, this video please give us a thumbs up please subscribe to this channel it's lovely to kind of see the numbers just kind of keep creeping up a little bit each week and know that more people are getting to see these and um check out these books and let us know down below um what you've made of these stories what do you like you know what don't you like and and go beyond that tell us about you know how 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 these characters kind of worked for you and um and how it would be in your neighborhood if this happened if there was a character like this if there was a very old man with enormous wings landed in somebody's garden how would people behave uh i'll see you very soon Take care.